Chapter six, interpersonal communication processes. <clears throat> Just to review really quickly, what is interpersonal communication? It's the process of exchanging messages between people whose lives mutually influence one another in unique ways in relation to social and cultural norms. It involves two or more people who are interdependent and to some degree in how they build a unique bond based on the larger social and cultural context to which they belong. So when you think of interpersonal relationships, these are not necessarily just your best friends, or but they're people that you have um, a recurring relationship with, um, your relationship is interdependent, um, in some contexts you rely on each other. Um, so those are the closer bonds that you have in your life. Uh, so let's, why, why do we study interpersonal communication? Interpersonal communication competence is the ability to communicate effectively and appropriately in our personal relationships. So when we learn to improve our interpersonal communication, we can improve our personal relationships, our professional re relationships, and our health, mental, and physical well-being. So effective interpersonal communication can do a lot to improve many areas of our lives. Um, just the better, better we are at maintaining those relationships that we have, um, the better we'll be overall. Um, aside from making your relationships um, and health better, interpersonal communication skills are highly sought after by potential employers, consistently ranking in the top 10 in national surveys. So think about this. Think about um, in a work environment or in a team environment, we have all met people that are just not great at maintaining interpersonal relationships. We've met people where we may encounter them and we might try to strike up a conversation and we try to find out more information about them to kind of build the relationships but we're only met with an obstacle we we know those people where um, we only get one word answers back or we only get nodding and so there's not a reciprocal um, nature in those relationships there's those people that maybe you find yourself constantly asking them questions about them and maybe they tell you all that information but they never respond with asking you anything about you so think about that that's when interpersonal communication kind of goes wrong and it's very difficult to build relationships like that so in our personal lives that reciprocal nature is important in our professional lives the people around you need to know that you care about them in some way that you are, are able to maintain dialogue and conversation with them and then for your own health and physical uh, mental well-being you need to have those relationships and have those connections with other people that can help your overall well-being so functions of interpersonal communication. We communicate to achieve certain goals in our relationships. We get things done in our relationship by communicating for instrumental goals. So that's one function. We maintain positive relationships through relationship goals. We strategically present ourselves in order to be perceived in a particular way. As our goals are met and our relationships build, they become little worlds that we inhabit with our relational partners complete with their own relationship culture. <clears throat> and I think most of us can kind of picture that when we have those close relationships. It does feel like it's its own little own little world that the rules that apply only apply in that world and it makes sense to us, to you and your close group of friends, but maybe not to the outside person. So, Cultural aspects of interpersonal communication. Relationship cultures are the climates established through interpersonal communication that are unique to the relational partners, but based on larger cultural and social norms. The schemata are blueprints or plans that show the inner workings of your relationships. Storytelling is an important part of how we create culture in larger contexts and how we create a uniting and meaningful storyline for our relationship. Idioms, personal idioms, are unique to certain relationships and they create a sense of belonging due to the inside meaning and shared by the relational partners. Relationship routines are communicative actions that create a sense of predictability in relationships that is comforting. 
and relationship rituals take on more symbolic meaning than do relationship routines and maybe variations on events like birthdays, anniversaries, things like that. Um, so think about your close relationships. Um, think about your close um, friendships from maybe high school or college. Um, think about your family dynamic. And I want you to think about all of these terms that we just discussed and how that applies to your relationships. Um, and I think we can all think of examples where we see these things in our in our friend in our friend groups or in our families that we know that there's a specific culture that we know that there's a way that our relationship works um, with those people around us that there are stories there are, there are memories that you share with these people um, that really kind of unite you and bring you together over time that you have a sense of belonging and, and you kind of sometimes may have inside meaning um, and shared information just between you and that relationship partners. I think it's interesting to think of the full scope of your relationships and everything that it can entail. Um, interpersonal conflict occurs in interactions where there are real or perceived incompatible goals, scarce resources, or opposing viewpoints. Conflict is an inevitable part of close relationships and can take a negative emotional toll. Improving your competence in dealing with conflict can yield positive effects in the real world. We all know that in the closer you are to someone, we know that conflict can arise. Um, and we all deal with conflict in different ways. Some of us are avoiders. Um, some of us may, things may come up that we disagree with and, and our goal is to avoid the conflict and we kind of overlook it. Some of us hit things head on and we kind of want to talk things out and tackle it. Um, we all know that people deal with conflict in, in different ways in relationships. Not all of us have like a real housewives um, viewpoint of conflict where it's public and it's big and it's um, over the top. Not, not everybody functions in that format. Um, but in order to be successful in interpersonal communication, you do need to learn how to deal with conflict effectively. Um, and, and sometimes, um, you know, that's swallowing our pride and biting our tongue, but we do need to know know how to deal with conflict. And there's different conflict management styles. Um, these, This is all in your book, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but there's different ways of addressing and, and, and hitting conflict. Um, you can kind of, we'll probably review these and you know kind of where you would fit in, what your con man conflict management style is. You can probably see what some of your closest friends conflict management style is, but it's just kind of how do you address conflict in your life. And for some of us, it's different depending on who we're dealing with. Um, for some of us, we, we, can, we can be pretty aggressive in our approach with some people, but very passive aggressive or, or just ignore it with others. So it just kind of varies. So tips for collaborating and achieving a win-win outcome with conflict management. Um, do not view the conflict as a contest you're trying to win. Remain flexible and realize there are solutions yet to be discovered. Distinguish the people from the problem and you, it shouldn't be personal. Determine what the underlying needs are that are driving the other person's demands. Identify areas of common ground or shared interests that you can work from to develop solutions. Ask questions to allow them to clarify and to help you understand their perspective. And listen carefully and provide verbal and nonverbal feedback. I think our biggest mistake is kind of one of the things, uh, number three, is that we make things personal. We, we take things personally if someone isn't going to agree with us. Culture and conflict. Think about the term saving face. Um, this term is generally referred to preventing embarrassment or preserving our reputation or image, um, which is similar to the concept of face in the interpersonal and inter intercultural communication. Our face is the projected self we desire to put into the world. And face work refers to the communication strategies we employ to project, maintain, or repair our face or maintain, repair, or challenge another's face. So face negotiation theory argues that people in all cultures negotiate face through communication encouragers, and that cultural factors influence how we engage in face work, especially in conflict situations. So individualistic cultures like the U.S. and most of Europe emphasize individual identity over group identity and encourage competition and self-reliance. 
Collective, collectivist cultures like Taiwan, Colombia, China, Japan, Vietnam, and Peru value in-group identity over individual identity, and they value conformity to social norms of the group. So face work strategies for different conflict management styles. You may be accommodating, um, you may avoid, you may compete where you defend your position and you persuade, or you may collaborate. <clears throat> Handling conflict better. Number one, identify conflict patterns. How does this conflict arise? And number two, negotiate steps and skills. Negotiation steps and skills. So emotions and interpersonal communications. So we know that emotions, we know that emotions are um, physiological, behavioral, and or communicative reactions to stimuli that are cognitively processed, processed and experienced as emotional pain. Primary emotions are innate emotions that are experienced for a short period of time and appear rapidly, usually as a reaction to an outside stimulus, and are experienced similar across cultures. Secondary emotions are not as innate as primary emotions, and they do not have corresponding facial expressions that makes them universally recognizable. So these aren't necessarily reflexive. They come from maybe a higher level of thinking, and they develop over time, and they take longer to fade away. So perspective on emotion, there's attachment theory, ties into the evolutionary perspective because researchers claim that it is in our nature as newborns to create social bonds with, with our primary caretaker. Attachment theory proposes that people develop one of the following atta three attachment styles um, that were either secure, avoidant, or anxious attachment style. So a, a secure attachment style reports that the relationship with their parents is warm and that their parents also have a positive and caring relationship with each other. So that's secure attachment style. Avoidant attachment, people with avoidant attachment styles report discomfort with closeness and are reluctant to depend on others. They quickly develop feelings of love for others, but those feelings lose intensity just as fast. Anxious attachment, people with anxious attachment styles report a desire for closeness, but anxieties about being abandoned. They regularly experience self-doubts, and they may blame their lack of love on others' unwillingness to commit rather than their own anxiety about being left. This style might develop because primary caregivers were not dependable or inconsistent. Alternatives between caring or nurturing and neglecting or harming. So think about that. Our ability to attach as to others as an adult is strongly connected to the attachments we had at a new as a newborn so this can even be as significant as or as simple as <clears throat> think about newborns that are preemies um, that they, uh, when they're born, they have so many issues, they're not able to be held by their parents on a daily basis. Um, that can affect attachment. So both parents are there, and both parents are there from the beginning, but they don't feel the same bond because they're separated from their parents in the hospitals. Um, so think of it even can be something like that. Um, but the attachments we developed as even as an infant, um, can impact our relationships and our ability to attach to others as we get older. Um, culture and emotion. Display rules are sociocultural norms that influence emotional expression. Um, they can, um, they, they dictate who can express emotions and which emotions can be expressed and how intense the emotions can be. So emotion sharing involves communicating the circumstances, thoughts, and feelings surrounding an emotional event. Contagion is spreading that emotion from one person to another. So that's um, somebody sad and crying that we're interacting with. So then that affects us. Emotional intelligence involves the ability to monitor one's own and others' feelings and emotions and to discriminate among them and to use this information to guide one's thinking and action. So emotional intelligence is to be able to um, identify emotions in other people and to identify our own emotions. Self-disclosure is purposeful disclosure of personal information to another person. Um, social penetration theory states that as we get to know someone, we engage in a reciprocal process of self-disclosure that changes in breadth and depth and affects how the relationship develops. 
Depth refers to how personal or sensitive the information is, and breadth refers to the range of topics. So think about self-disclosure. Um, if we don't continue to disclose things about ourselves with others, the relationship has a hard time growing. Um, social comparison theory states that we evaluate ourselves based on how we compare with others. We may disclose information about our intellectual aptitude or athletic ability to see how we compare or relate to other people's other people. So Jahari basically said um, he defined self-disclosure in this way, that there's our open self. That's information that's known to self, known to others. That's things that it can obviously be seen um, by the people around us. Um, we don't even have to tell them. It's, it's open. Um, hidden self is known to us, but it's not known to others. The blind spot is not known to us, but it's known to others. So think about there are all these things about us that others notice that we don't. Um, there are, there are ticks, there are, um, nervous habits or things that we do that we may never not be aware of but those that are around us a great deal are and then there's the unknown self that's our future self that's things that nobody knows we don't know it and others don't know it so the process of self-disclosure revolves um, involves observations, thoughts, feelings, and needs. Some people are naturally more transparent and willing to self-disclose. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm one of those people that people feel the need to share a lot of things with. Um, if I'm sitting in the doctor's office or in line at the grocery store or getting a pedicure, it never fails that someone begins to talk to me and share an enormous amount of information with me that I may not have needed to know. And sometimes I don't necessarily want to know. Um, but so there's some people that just, they're transparent. They're an open book. They'll tell anything to anyone. Um, I remember years ago, um, I was at Walmart and I was checking out and the lady asked me how I was. And I said, I'm doing fine. How are you? And she says, well, I'm not good. I'm not good at all. And I said, I'm sorry to hear that. She says, yeah, my boyfriend slept with my sister and now we're breaking up and now I don't speak to my sister. And it was this long interaction and I had never met this lady prior to this incident. <clears throat> but that was a lot of information in a brief period of time. So some people um, do that. I mean, they, they're they fine with self-disclosure and it doesn't matter how well they know you. Um, Self-focused reasons for disclosure include having a sense of relief or catharsis, clarifying or correcting information or seeking support. I think I've noticed this um Sometimes on social media, there are friends of mine that I notice like every, I can tell that they're, they're having a hard time. I can tell that they're having a bad day. I can tell that they're happy about something. I feel like it's cathartic for them to post things on social media, um, on a regular basis, uh, to let everyone know what's going on in their life. And some people are like that, um, in our interpersonal relationships, it's cathartic for them to tell everything to talk about things. Um, deciding when to disclose something in a conversation may not seem as important as deciding whether or not to disclose, but you want to ensure that you don't disclose in an awkward time and that leads to a negative result. So if there's information you're planning on disclosing, just make sure that you choose the right time to do so. Um, so sometimes though, self-disclosure is unplanned. Um, dispositional attribution. If you think the personality trait, um, effects of disclosure on the relationship. If you think the personality trait to which you attribute the disclosure is positive, then your reaction to disclosure is more likely to be positive. Situational attributions identify the cause of disclosure within the context or surrounding in which it takes place. And interpersonal attributions identify the relationship between the sender and the receiver as the cause of the disclosure. So when you think about interpersonal uh, relationships, interpersonal interactions, it's a very interesting topic. It's an interesting topic when you kind of sit back and you look at your own relationships, whether it be your friendships or your family relationships, and you see kind of the dynamic that plays in that interpersonal communication. It's interesting when you think of self-disclosure. Where are you in the, in the spectrum of feeling comfortable with self-disclosure? Is that something that's very challenging for you to do? Is that something that's very easy? Um, and I think we all can think of relationships that we've had that have ceased because self-disclosure ceased. Um, you stopped maybe being 
feeling comfortable communicating things about yourself with your friend um, or the person that you are dating or whoever. And so when you stop disclosing information, then you stop building that relationship. And so the relationship does not grow like it should. Um, but it's an interesting topic to look into and it's an interesting lens to analyze the relationships that you have on a day-to-day -day basis.